በየትኛው ዓለም ያላችሁ ሁላችሁንም virtual ቡና ጠጦ ብለን እንጋብዛለን ማውራት ከፈለጋችሁ ሐሳብ ማካፈል ከፈለጋችሁ ቡና መጠጣት ከፈለጋችሁ ከኛ ጋራ ወይ እናንተ ቡና ጠጦ ብላችሁ ከጋብዛችሁን ለሁለቱም ፈቃደኞች ነን in 1895 italy hoping a foreign war might distract its people from the stresses of their country's unification mounted a full scale invasion The Italians were confident they could add Ethiopia to their growing empire around the Horn of Africa. But what happened next in the Adwa Mountains would seal Ethiopia's reputation as an African promised land. The Battle of Adwa is his muse, a constant motif in his work. What is it that happened at Adwa that is so meaningful? Adwa rescued my identity. Uh, being an African and being an Ethiopian, an original Ethiopian. At that time, almost all African nations were under colony. They didn't imagine that they can win white warriors or white colonizers in their lifetime. Hello, everyone. We are celebrating Black History Month in the Battle of Adwa. Last week we read a very interesting article about a black Canadian man who tried to raise an army for Ethiopia during the Italian invasion in 1935 on Television Ontario. How was the article? We are celebrating the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Adwa uh, throughout the world uh, and uh, as you know February is the Black History Month so it was the uh, Adwa victory that uh, inspired black uh, freedom uh, movements all over the world and uh, as you mentioned uh, earlier uh, TVO the Ontario television website last uh, week on February 16 uh, published an article about a black Canadian man uh, who tried to uh, raise and volunteer for the fascist invasion in, it- in Ethiopia immediately before uh, second world war which is 1935 and uh, this man name was Elridge Itman article was written by Daniel uh, Penton and uh, it says when a country came under threat from fascist Italy black communities in Ontario which is uh, a province we are living in rallied to the cause and a champion uh, sprinter uh, recruited for an Ethiopian foreign uh, fighters and uh, It's a very uh, important uh, article about uh, what's happening dur- during the second Ethiopian and Italian uh, war uh, and many uh, black people who live in the US and uh, Europe were try to support the Ethiopians and uh, Haile Selassie's uh, Uh, battle with the uh, uh, Benito Mussolini uh, invasion and uh, we have never never read and we have never heard about a Canadian uh, black people who who supported Ethiopian cause we read about uh, the American uh, pilot his name is Robinson who volunteered in Ethiopia and and other black Afro- African Americans but never heard of uh, a black canadian uh, who who tried to raise such a noble cause and we are very grateful as ethiopian canadian we are very grateful about uh, elridge uh, and his uh, courage to support uh, ethiopia and to fight against fascism during that very tough time when where black people in america and canada were living under a very serious uh, racial uh, segregation so it was a very uh, interesting historical time for black people in canada and uh, the us and this guy was a very courageous so we have to celebrate elridge and uh, his uh, deed during this uh, 125th anniversary of the Adwan victory and the Black History Month.
Ahmad, we have in this edition of our program. In this edition of our program, we talk about the Battle of Adwa, as we said earlier, and an African victory, which happened 125th year, uh, years before uh, in Ethiopia, in the northern part of Ethiopia, the place called Adwa, which is found in Tigray. And the victory of Adwa is a historical and a symbolic victory uh, for all black people and for all uh, black nation uh, under uh, colony and uh, Ethiopians uh, paved the way to by defeating uh, the white supremacist uh, power uh, who which came to invade the sovereignty of uh, an old uh, nation in Africa in this edition uh, a young Ethiopian Canadian his name is Hisop McConnell, will share his view about the Battle of Adwa and black racism and uh, the days of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And our regular contributor, uh, uh, Keith Powell, will reflect about uh, the black history and the changing DNA of uh, Canada through times and about TV or documentary. I hope you watch uh, the TV or documentary about Ethiopia, Senegal, and Kenya, and about uh, African Renaissance, and we discussed about that documentary and uh, things related uh, black Africa and uh, African Americans and African Canadian uh, Africans' life and history. <music> We hope you will enjoy our program. Stay tuned. So with this, uh, we come to our today's virtual uh, coffee time conversation uh, about, uh, about uh, the African uh, issue and, you know, the Black uh, History Month and things related with, with this uh, issue. Uh, our yes. co- Conversation is based on on the documentary uh, that was uh, transmitted, uh, and even now it's transmitting. So, so it's a series, so it's about yes. Africa, Africa, and uh, Africa, Africa's past. So first, yes. I, would li- I would like to ask you, kids, uh, as a uh, uh, lover of art, a reader, and uh, explorer and traveler. You, you see so many cultures and so many uh, things uh, in different cultures, in different continents. And I know that you traveled to Africa a uh, uh, couple of times and you visited some of the countries. Mm-hmm. So uh, based mm-hmm. on your uh, visit and based on your reading and your close contact with the African culture, what's your impression and what's your uh, outlook about that continent and about that culture? That whole continent, my God, that's a very big question. I, I think that probably you and I will be in bed sleeping by the time a full answer to that question could yes. be given. Let's let's ha- let's let's have our, our coffee, and that makes us, you know, <laughs> James. Absolutely, James. absolutely. Uh, so, the, the, uh, I, I, I'm going to touch on that about my coffee, and yes. what what I wanted to say was. Um, you know, the diversity and the depth of, of cultural richness in Africa. Uh, I'm so delighted that TV Ontario has a series about African cultures now, because I, it's sad to me that Canadians have not had the opportunity to know how rich, how diverse, how wonderful African cultures and African peoples are. And just as a small indication, you know, right here, we have a, a culture in, in East Africa <laughs> where coffee itself originated and mm-hmm. where there has been thousands of years of sophisticated culture that many Canadians know nothing about in Ethiopia. Uh, so it's wonderful. The first series, the first program in the series that's on TVO uh, each once a week right now. Uh, touched on Ethiopia, and it was great that it showed a modern, a country in its modern context. It showed it in a connected to the world context. It didn't just show the nice animals and the quaint clothing that African people uh, in many places wear. Those are wonderful things, but too often, if those are the only things that are shown, uh, an audience 
Canadians uh, can end up thinking, oh, well, you know, everybody in Africa lives in a grass hut and wears colorful clothing and there's animals going by their door. That is too, far too simple. Um, so, so I'm first delighted that TV Ontario is showing uh, a series uh, that you, you can't see the series without knowing these are, these are fascinating places. Yeah. These are um, rich and deep cultures and they have a lot if you dig in and start learning and reading and viewing, there's, there's a lot to learn and a lot to enjoy. Yeah. Do you mind if I say one more thing? I know it's a long answer to your question, but yeah. um, the time, uh, the, the, I, my, I have not been to West or South Africa. I've been to East Africa and uh, in Morocco in North Africa. And the time, um, I would say the time I enjoyed the most was in East Africa. Uh, I went with my daughter, uh, Speaking of a child who was encouraged to uh, be her full self, my other coffee mug is one that she made for me. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so, she made that for me, but that was when she was young. When she was older, uh, yeah. she did her research in uh, Kenya and in Tanzania. Yeah. And I went, I've, so I went to Tanzania, in fact, three times and worked with her and spent time with her in her field sites. And her field sites were in rural settings where people grow and produce their own food. So not urban, not uh, market-driven economies. And what did I find? Uh, the whole diversity of personalities and life circumstances and uh, uh, communities or villages where some people had done really well and were more comfortable and other people were struggling, a uh, mixture of different beliefs, uh, some Christian, some Muslim, and some uh, neither of those two. But I, the thing that I most appreciated and enjoyed was the way in which um, I was made to feel welcome. And I was uh, allowed an emotional closeness, a, relation, a relationship closeness with people that was just awesome. And I've, ne I've never forgotten that. Um, it, it seemed to me that our uh, European or Canadian culture is a little more guarded. Good spirits, good people, but um, I don't know what it, why, why I can perceive such a difference, but that sense of warmth, of uh, spontaneity and welcome uh, was... I just I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to experience that in my life. And I hope I hope a little that this series of programs on TVO shows gives a feeling of that a little bit. I think it's I felt it a little bit in the, the programs that I've seen. Absolutely. You know, especially the, they did this uh, programming uh, based on the Black uh, History Month uh, in February. So so that it, uh, you know, reflects what's happening in the in the roots of the black the people who are living in uh, america in canada and in north uh, usa uh, yeah. you know as you know the historical background is directly related with slavery and colonialism so unfortunately uh, the europeans are colonizers and africans are colonized so in this yeah. in this struggle the country uh, which was pres presented on TV or documentary at, at the beginning uh, of the, uh, the documentary was Ethiopia. I think, yep. uh, I don't know whether they did it deliberately or not, but Ethiopia is uh, the country uh, which has never been colonized in, in, the, in the continent. The Italians yes, try, right. tried one, uh, one time and they, they stay for five years with a big resistance. Uh, and Ethiopia was considered as a torch bearer of uh, African uh, freedom, even uh, for uh, African Americans in the United States, were uh, volunteering to to fight with the fascists in in the 1930s. So, uh, based on this historical background, uh, what what is the intention? What's the the view of the Europeans or I I'm a fortunate man. I, I had a good education and yeah. I pursued studies about other 
other cultures. I learned other languages. So I, so it's, I just have to be careful uh, that mm. my response is, it, I'm, I'm aware it's probably a reflection of my experience yeah. um, and the knowledge that I've uh, gained and may not be uh, reflective of what many others. Certainly, um, if you take a look at what, what, what people's sources of information are, until very recently, in other words, before the time of the internet, yeah. The sources of information were magazines, newspapers, and television, and radio. Fortunately, in Canada, we've had a, a national broadcasting network that has not just focused on Canadian issues. It has really played a constructive role in helping Canadians um, have an appreciation for other peoples, other cultures, other ways of thinking, uh, not just the way that we hear on the mainstream media. So and it's great that we've had the CBC to do that. But nonetheless, when you take a look at how, if you ask the question, how much coverage was there uh, prior to the internet, I'm saying here, mm. of issues related to Africa or even to other continents? And it was very limited. It tended to be about disasters or about political upheaval. And it often tended to have it reflected the legacy of colonialism in that it was about the places in the world where the French or the English had had their colonies and where consequently people spoke English. Of course, <laughs> of course, our news is going to be in the, our languages, English and French. So, uh, in all, not, uh, so this is what we hear. We hear language, you know, we hear stories about Africa that's about the English speaking places in Africa. Yeah. Uh, and when people are interviewed, people who speak English are sought out. So, so what I'm saying is that to a huge extent, we were pretty ignorant about Africa. We were pretty ignorant about the uh, very ancient history of um, the development of African societies and African culture. So what do I think people now believe about Africa? I, I think there's still a legacy of, of that ignorance uh, it's, 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 and I use the word ignorance, yes, a little bit pejoratively to say it's, it's not good, mm. but also in a more neutral way to say people just don't know. If you haven't heard it anywhere, you haven't seen it anywhere, you're likely going to continue believing the drift that you hear or have been exposed to, which is just the superficial, trivial stuff, you know, uh, Famines in Ethiopia, um, communist government overthrowing the emperor, um, Rastafarian people set, trying to set up a freedom country in Abyssinia. It, it, it's fascinating how these pretty much irrelevant details uh, get carried on. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think it's so great that we have ethnic media that is being supported by the Canadian, Canadian government. It allows a conversation that breaks those norms, breaks those barriers, and even creates an opportunity for um, new Canadians to tell their stories that can be then uh, picked up by, learned and under understood yeah. by um, Canadians of earlier generations. So prior to the internet, um, people knew about the wild animals, uh, People knew about the end of colonialism, uh, but they didn't have an understanding, I would say, uh, of the depth and um, wisdom, the sophistication, the validity of so many African cultures. And I think it's great that slowly but surely we're getting to have that now. Uh, recently, you know, Jeff Pierce, the writer, journalist and historian, uh, in one of the conversation on Zoom, says, I don't care. He was quoting uh, an editor uh, of a, a, a newspaper, I think, uh, where, which he was working on. I don't care why Africans are fighting, but show me Africans are fighting, he says. This was the editor telling him, Jeff Pierce, to report yeah. on, on Africa. And yeah, this is yeah. a quotation. I don't care why Africans are fighting. 
So how could you know a civilized a civilized person uh, can think like that? You know, uh, he, he's a journalist, he's an editor, uh, but look what. Uh, he, he, so the editor, uh, his job wasn't to tell the truth or to uh, his role wasn't to help educate people better yeah. or even to uh, lead the evolution of good moral behavior of a community or of a people. His job is to sell newspapers or to, to get people to view the channel. And, you know, there's a paradox in that. There's maybe even um, a threat and a tragedy that people we all sort of want us, the fire engine goes by, where's the fire? Oh, that's, let, let's check that out. Or um, when you see a baby, you know, that thinking about the, the uh, mantra about show, you know, show, show pretty women, babies and disasters, and you can sell whatever media you want, that human beings somehow are suckers for that stuff and we can't resist looking at it. Uh, so I look at some, some media that I hear on the radio and see on TV, and, and that's all they have. It's all disasters and, and uh, uh, romance and um, silliness by human beings. It, it, there's no substance. That's a, that's a risk for all of us. So I'm not surprised to hear a, a writer or a journalist saying that's what I was directed to produce. Uh, that would be a dilemma for a journalist, I, I would myself find myself thinking, I'm not sure I want to work for this, this outfit. Um, because I'm just part of the myth making. I'm not part of the truth. I'm not part of the learning and the growing. Well, uh, what um, we know, uh, what do you think about the impact of this kind of journalism and this kind of reporting uh, affect the general audience? I mean, the audience we are uh, having in North America or in Europe, how much of this is taken by the the mass, yeah. the, the reader? Yeah. I that's a. I mean, there's a. I think there's a research uh, opportunity there that perhaps somebody has undertaken that. I'm not aware of it. Yeah. Um, what do what? Life is complex. It isn't just a matter of seeing something on television or on the internet and all of a sudden going, okay, I get it. Yeah, people are predisposed. People are inclined to believe certain things based on uh, cultural traditions they've absorbed, based on stereotypes and prejudices they may carry, uh, and even based on what authorities they believe in, uh, be they government or be they... Uh, sects or churches, uh, teachers they've had, um, pe people of authority can guide humans to certain beliefs and certain um, habits. And um, I think that's why I am grateful for a CBC and a TVO, because they clearly um, pay attention to the... Mm, the ethical correctness of what they're talking about. They clearly are concerned that they are not being prejudiced or racist or uh, colonialist in their coverage. And uh, over time, I suspect that's paying dividends to Canadian society. Uh, is there a connection between the fact that we've had that kind of uh, guidance uh, from our national media, from to great to some extent, from our government, uh, in our school systems, and the fact that Canada now is has a reputation, at least, for being a welcoming, a diversity-loving country, at least more so than most, not all, but it's it's part. It, we've been characterized as as honoring or believing in those things, and where did that come from? I'm, I think part of the uh, Teachings of Christian churches uh, have enabled that, not just Christian churches. I suspect that Native beliefs and culture uh, played into that in ways uh, John Ralston Saul writes about a little bit in one of his books, but I, I suspect they, those values and traditions have played into the personality of Canadian society these days. 
There you go. አዲስ ቅኝት መቀመጫውን በቶሮንቶ ካናዳ ያደረገ የሚዲያ አገልግሎት ነው ዝግጅቶቻችንን በአዲስ ቅኝት ዌብሳይት www.addisperspective.com እንዲሁም በአዲስ ቅኝት ዩቲዩብ ቻናል እና ኒው ፐርስፔክቲቭ ፖድካስት ላይ እንድትከታተሉን እንጋብዛለን My name is Hesop. I am 10 years old and I am here because I want to talk about Black History Month and celebrate our people's sky. And uh well I'm here to the new perspective to tell you that the, there is a Black History Month and why we celebrate it and why is it important for us all well the reason for that is a very long time ago uh, our kind of black people were enslaved with white people and uh, because we had uh, the black skin uh, people uh, that are black Uh, st- uh stood up and said that this is enough Africans from all around the world were getting enslaved only for one country to stood up to other Africans and show everybody that they will never be enslaved and they would show people that the being enslaved is wrong That country is called Ethiopia in the Battle of Adwa. For the first uh, Adwa battle, as we know, the one that stood up and showed everybody that Ethiopia can't be enslaved and blacks uh, needs to have their freedom and rights was King Mililik. And King Mililik uh with his wife the stood up uh, and battled the Italians and uh, speaking of your uh, you know the tv or about africa or other uh, cultures uh, this this tv or production is a good example in most of the production or in most of the reporting there is a white expert about africa not the yeah. pers- the person who knows that culture not the person who studied that culture so this yeah. is i think uh the the bias uh where the bias comes from so in this yeah. t- tv or production uh, we see uh, i think a black woman or a, a, a woman who has african background uh you know doing the production and the directing and the writing Yes. So I yes. think that that gives it a kind of value to to believe what's what the story is about. Yes. So how how do you yes. reflect on that here? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh you know, if, if you truly believe that someone is uh, wise yes. and has good information, better insight and information than others, then when you have questions about their their society, their circumstances, you ask them. <laughs> you don't ask somebody else you ask them mm. and, and uh, in this way uh, you get um, at least a, a, a perspective that's honest from the place where the issues are happening it may not be the only perspective and it may not be the majority perspective but at least it's one of the important perspectives and it, it um, by by those by people being interviewed or being asked to guide the learning and the thinking of an audience on television in that way it it clearly uh, honors their wisdom and their knowledge and their experience and that's transformative instead of a, a journalist or a, an editor saying well that's what's happening in africa these days and um, you know it's really too bad but we here in north america or europe we're fine we don't have to worry about it no uh it humanizes it when you speak to people directly and when you realize that um we are not that we're not different here in North America in fact uh, there are so many similarities 
uh, it opens up the whole world. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Ralston Saul's book is a wonderful caution about the loss of um, citizen, citizen freedom and citizen choice uh, due to corporate dominance, corporate power and its influence on government. Yeah. And I would even say brainwashing uh, through advertising and uh, a seduction of people to, th to think about cons products and uh, consumption in ways that uh, are, are serve the corporation well, but don't necessarily uh, do important things for the individual consumer. Uh, I would recommend people uh, either listen to the lectures or read, read his book about the unconscious society. That's a, the powers are changing uh, these days. Uh, national governments are no longer um, the only powers that influence uh, the big, make the big decisions in our society. Perhaps in the past, it was churches. Perhaps before that, it was dukes and chiefs. Uh, now we have major international corporations making decisions, decisions that affect us absolutely profoundly our freedoms, our, our levels of wage, our life circumstances, and global warming. Yes. And we shouldn't be naive uh, about where that power is residing and uh, how conscious we need to be about it. So I do encourage people to, to pay some attention to that book. That, that's really a very interesting. So yeah. talking about the equality, uh, let's uh, discuss about the black issue in North America, in Canada, uh, because this is February, so uh, I need to listen your reflection on this. Uh. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's the first thing I'm going to say is that, that it's I feel a sadness that our discussion about black uh, culture, black history, yeah. is always framed by the abuse of slavery that has been the history of black presence in North America. I'm sure native people would say, uh, Jan, don't forget what happened to our cultures and our peoples as well. But since it's Black History Month, I'll focus there. Uh, I, I think it's just tragic that the conversation limits and restricts the identity of black people to the survivors of slavery. I'm in no way diminishing the importance of that issue and the work that needs to be done. In fact, I'm very hesitant to say very much because I'm white. I know I've had a privileged experience in Canada related to that. Um, I, just, I just carry that emotion within me that uh, it's sad that the um, citizenship of black people is too often understood in terms of the um, this history of slavery and discrimination that has preceded these times. Uh, it's, the work, there's so much work to be done. Yeah, all we have to do is look at the recent uh, history, recent things that have happened in the United States, and we just you just shudder um, at, at how little um, honesty there has been, um, how um, little um, compromise and uh, negotiation has occurred. How, how do the disadvantaged um, ever get ahead? when those seem to be the predominant behaviors and influences. Um, I've been reading material about the COVID pandemic and uh, one of the chapters in one of the books I read talked about, uh, so what are the, con what have we lost? What are, what, what are the consequences that this pandemic has had for us? It, it, the author's an American woman. And um, I, I don't have a great memory for statistics, but I remember this. Uh, she said that the, um, in, in cities where people live more closely with each other, and consequently there tends to be more contagion when there's a pandemic, more, the infection spreads more easily, cities, the, the percentage of non-whites in America is much higher in cities than in rural areas. So what this means is that the incidence of COVID-19 is much higher for people who are for, for the non-white population of America than for the white population, simply because of where people are living. Of course, there's reasons why people are living where they are. Uh, 
And um, in relation to that, in, in the cities, uh, in urban settings, the statistic were up about healthcare, it's, you know, you're more likely to get COVID if you live in a city. And that means if you're a person of color, you're more likely to get on average compared to your other uh, American citizens, you're more likely to get the infection simply because you're living in a place where the incidence is higher. Um, if you get the infection, uh, what kind of medical care will you have? And of course, we know that in Canada, medical health is almost a universal right. Now, it's not true that everyone has equal access to it, but it is, uh, at least in principle or in policy, considered a universal right. Well, that's just not the case in the United States. Uh, and who are the people who most need health care? Is it the wealthy people who tend to be white in America, who can pay for their medical care if they need it? No, it's the people who are least advantaged who need a policy of universal medical care. And they're the ones who uh, will most suffer consequences from a pandemic like COVID. So urban populations, 19% of urban populations have zero health care in the United States. That means one in five people have no ability to access health, uh, health related care, including when they have a pandemic. So guess who does? It's outrageous. It's outrageous. So it's not just um, what we teach our children about diversity, about people of other races, religions, and cultures. It's what policies our governments put in place and what we demand our governments do to ensure that we all are treated equally. So those are some of the things that I think our America is clearly struggling with. Uh, and I just hope that, uh, I hope that the Black History Month helps influence the new government in the United States to not just uh, deal with the myriad of issues it has to deal with, but to focus very much on purposeful um, removal of barriers to full inclusion and full rights that are, that have been there for decades and uh, continue to will, they will continue to be in place unless there is a purposeful removal of those barriers, a decision to make it different. እየተከታተላችኋላችሁት ያዲስ ቅኝትን የሚዲያ አገልግሎት ነው ሼር ላይክ ሰብስክራይብ ኮሜንት ማድረግን አትርሱ ያዲስ ቅኝት የሚዲያ አገልግሎት George Floyd died in a, in front of cameras and everybody saw in the whole world how George Floyd was killed. Uh, they were disturbed of what they saw with George Floyd and more African uh, were dying. But um, we're, we're standing up to our rights and showing that we can't be enslaved again. <laughs> Every human is the same and I feel like what happened to George Floyd didn't need to happen at all. Yeah, uh, how about uh, the Canadian uh, issue? I mean, do you, do you think there is enough political determination uh, from the government or from any political uh, groups and from even from the the society, the civilized Canadian society. You know, Canada is considered one of the best countries in the world and one of the educated and you know, wealthiest countries in the world. But still, Canada is not a perfect country. There is still a problem. Yep. And we have uh, historically sharing so many things with the United States and the slavery issue is here. The black issue is here. The systemic racism is here. So do you think there is a determination and willingness to, to change this, uh, this uh, historical problem? You I don't think so. No, I don't think there is, not nearly enough. Uh, I, I think that sort of uh, there's, a, there's an awareness at policy-making levels and that uh, 
even governmental levels, that there is a need for that. But I don't see, I'm just not aware. Again, I can't say I'm as informed as I should be to answer this question, but uh, I, I don't see that there is a um, sort of overarching set of policies and initiatives that actually systematically address the issues of uh, racist attitudes, uh, disadvantage through education, lack of access to public services and healthcare. Um, there's, just, there's just a lot of work that I think still needs to be done. And I think it's more apparent in some parts of our country than in others. I, I think that ground has been gained in some of the cities that have been welcoming people of other cultures for decades. I think that the education systems there seem to have broadened their curriculum and, and they now have teachers who are from other cultures and they're fine people. And the kids, they you know the uh, white English speaking kids or the white French speaking kids, they see these teachers, they love them. They understand they're full human beings. And so that changes bit by bit changes uh, the disposition within citizens. Mm. The young citizens of today will be the voting citizens, the policy making decision uh, citizens of tomorrow. Uh, kids who've had that inclusive and valuing experience will move things forward in the future. Uh, I, I, I think I might have shared with you, there's an expression I heard years ago in relation to the slow pace of social change mm. <laughs> and that and how people in power tend not to change unless they're forced to their they, so attitudes persist and that expression is progress occurs one death at a time <laughs> and it's 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 cynically said but it's a way of acknowledging that um once something's in place it doesn't change very quickly yeah. unless there's purposeful and systematic uh, commitment at all levels to to address that interesting you know a long time ago when i came to canada i get a chance to do a documentary uh, it didn't go through but i i tried to to make a documentary about a canadian who was interested in in the african philosophy as you know the this the euro the eurocentric view uh, says that uh, there there is no philosophy coming from Africa or you know or the Africa is not uh, for philosophy so the afrocentric view says uh, Africa has its own uh, philosophy even though it's in oral tradition oral literature and uh, in in many ways uh, in African yeah. ways but this this person this Canadian uh, scholar studied uh, a philosophy in Africa which is from in Ethiopia. And uh, the medieval philosopher who, uh, who this uh, professor studied was uh, Zara Ayako, and he wrote his, his, his own philosophy. And this guy translated it into English, and mm -hmm. he, he gave lectures throughout the world, even in Canada, in Europe, and in America. And he, he talked about this guy, and he said that this guy, this philosopher, Ethiopian philosopher, Zarayako, was the first person to create reasoning before Descartes did in, 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 in Europe. He argued, yeah. he argued. And uh, yeah. I was wondering, this guy was a bridge between Africa and Canada, or, you know, the yeah. West, the West and Africa. So I, I, I was determined to do his uh, story uh, yeah. in, in parallel with uh, the philosopher, the Ethiopian philosopher, Zarayako. The question I want to ask you is, do you think Africans can't philosophize? Do you think uh, philosophy is uh, just for white men or for European? <laughs> of course they can, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, if you listen, if if you would listen, uh, that's the right way, uh, because some of the philosophy uh, has been passed on through oral traditions. Uh, if you listen to them, uh, you can hear 
the um, comparison of ideas, uh, the toying with notions, the explorations for meaning, the arguments for uh, most valid processes or uh, most uh, coherent epistemologies. You can hear all of that in uh, what people have. Well, you can hear it in the oral traditions, the stories that are passed on. And uh, I think there's, in, in, in the last, what, two generations, been an explosion of written literature uh, by young African writers uh, where that capacity is so apparent. Uh, and, uh, I mean, of, of, of course, uh, it... it you know, philosophy in Europe um, was, it was the property of the church for the longest time. It was a place the church enabled discussion and debate and learning and scholarship, the evolution of wisdom, but it also, uh, to too great an extent, restricted the boundaries of those discussions and sort of stamped its, its, uh, mark of ownership on on thinking mm. uh, re thereby restricting to some extent uh, the learning that could come from that yeah. uh, and i you know we all cultures are susceptible to those types of uh, authoritarian or even conceptual limits that can get overlaid uh, there's no question. Yeah, I think about Ethiopia and its uh, tradition of uh, wax and gold. Yeah. Um, it's not philosophy, but it reflects the nimbleness of thinking uh, and a willingness to put it out there, to, to suggest that the way things are being seen isn't the whole truth, that there are levels and that you should be comparing and connecting those levels in your thinking if you truly want to know the truth about what's going on. And I think that tradition is a wonderful way of, of speaking a truth about what life is uh, and what's going on even politically uh, without uh, writing a book or without being a journalist. There are ways in which the people speak and show that they are philosophers. But the, in, in, the, in the case I mentioned in, in my first question, there is a solid philosophy written by uh, an Ethiopian. I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, I have the Amharic uh, version of this, this book. This is, this is a book, the Amharic. And this yes. is the, the imaginary portrait of the philosopher Zarayako. And he was okay. uh, the 1600 uh, or medieval Ethiopia philosopher. And he wrote this book. It's called uh, The Thirsty of Zarayako or Matsahafa Filsifina. Or Hatata Zarayako is uh, the original title. Yeah. And the, this, philosoph this uh, professor from Montreal uh, studied it, translated it. Yeah from Gus to English, and he studied okay. it, he studied it, and he uh, compared it with the European uh, parallel of this, uh, this philosophy, which is Descartes, okay. and yeah. he, he reached on uh, conclusion that this uh, book was, or this philosophy was written in Africa, in Ethiopia, before, before. De Descartes yeah. Descartes introduced his reasoning yeah. to the European uh, scholar or scholastic landscape or in, you know, in academy. Which, which, so, which does, it, it, I would think that does not signal a one-off, this unique man who just happened to be brilliant and be able to do this. Yeah. I think it tells us that we didn't know yeah. that there were traditions, intellectual traditions, Yes. Uh, and the degree of uh, sort of uh, academic wisdom that uh, created this man, enabled him to, uh, to be able to theorize and philosophize in the way that he did. We just, 
we were just we have been ignorant of the fact that those traditions existed long long ago before they did in europe yes the question is you know i see it this way it is uh, the european way or the eurocentric way who set standards and yeah. the, the other values the other uh, knowledge are not leveled you know uh, in the european uh, terms so they, they are lesser than or you know uh, com- when they compare with the european standard yeah. so well, uh, still this tradition is continued i think in many ways the european standard is the highest standard of knowledge the highest standard of culture the highest standard of you know, everything so the rest is under that so even though philosophy was uh, happening in other parts of the world in africa and elsewhere but european standard doesn't recognize it if the european yeah. stand- standard doesn't recognize it there is no knowledge or there is no philosophy yeah yeah so that's I, just hubris that, that's just vanity and pride it's it's ignorance it's based in ignorance uh and you know many dominant cultures are susceptible to think that way about themselves we're the best no one else is as good as us uh you, you uh, know there are many iterate many iterations of that you know we're god's chosen people the rest of you guys too bad it's just not true it's just not true you know and uh it's dangerous thinking uh perhaps it's normal uh, perhaps you know when you uh, have studied something for a long time and you get to have uh, insight and capacity and expertise with it you you feel good about what you've learned and that you have something to teach and if you don't hear others talking about it you think well wow i'm special i can do this better than others well it might be true but it might not just because you don't know of other tr- it doesn't mean there aren't some that exist and it also doesn't mean yours is the best <laughs> this is the, i think the the whole idea of colonizing others in the name of civilizing others you know when yeah. the, the first europeans came to africa they considered the african uh, tradition as a barbaric and you know uncivilized we can mention the right the writer uh, the european who who gave the blueprint for colonizers joseph conrad i think in the heart of darkness that 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 book that book give the blueprint for uh, the belgian king i think leopold uh to yeah. to conquer uh congo and you know the african that's in those days and that thinking and that way of looking into african tradition and the culture is still persisted i think uh, in absolutely it, it, and you know um perhaps because we are uh, descendants of a european culture at least mm-hmm. here in north america we have become that way uh, we have seen ourselves that way the dominant culture uh, the last 3 400 years certainly has been of that background perhaps that's why when we look at european culture we're um, somewhat able to say there were some problems mm. there were mistakes made that's partly the conversation we're having now we're able to say uh, you know we who we talk about ourselves more than we talk about others in life it mm. seems to be the way humans are they talk about their families their culture their society their religion they're the best they're the important one it, it it's probably tied to just the ability to survive you have to take care of business um but the there's a there's such short sightedness that can come from that and uh you know the pandemic is teaching us we're all connected even if we don't want to be everywhere in the world is connected now uh the internet is allowing us to understand that that's an opportunity that there's so much out there that others are doing well are doing differently that we could apply to our circumstances uh all that's a, a real boon and uh i just i just hope that the narrow focus of european culture european traditions european legal systems european 
religions even being uh, the best or the derivatives from those are the best. I just hope that uh, people are open to understanding that they're restricting themselves by thinking that way. Mm. They're not able to uh, be as wise or uh, to take as, uh, as full a, an advantage as they otherwise could if they could welcome the experience, the voices, the knowledge of others. Uh, not just those from Africa, certainly those from Africa. That's, the, that's our conversation here. Yeah. But uh, I've been reading material uh, written by Native uh, Americans and Native Canadians. Yes. Well, what, a, what an incredible wealth of knowledge about how to live on this earth and how to live together. And uh, I just hope that uh, more and more people will open their minds and hearts to seeing what Native Canadians and Americans have to say. There is, so, we could learn so much if we listened more and shed the, uh, the mindset that said, oh, well, you know, Europe was a society of sophisticated, progressive people, and that North Americans were primitive savages. It's absolute nonsense. And it, those statements, those words alone, reflect the biases and the prejudices, the ignorance, the short-sightedness that uh, so many uh, people coming from Europe, so many descendants still from Europe, um, that they carry within themselves. We, we need to fight that. We need to resist that. We need to educate differently about that. And I'm, I'm happy that I see that happening. It's so great that so much of this is happening in my life. Yeah. I look, you know, I'm, I'm in my 70s now. I could look back and, and see periods. I, I, when you and I have talked previously, there have been times when I, you look back and it, you just shake your head that only 40, 50 years ago, attitudes were much less open-minded and much less progressive, much less welcoming of diversity. Huge change has happened. And I'm just so happy that uh, it's happening in my lifetime. Uh, I could be looking back going, where did I get these insights? Nobody else seems to think the way I'm thinking. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe everything from Europe is the best. <laughs> you know what? This this problem is uh, not only in, you know, I know that we are discussing about Africa and Europe, the Eurocentric and the Afrocentric, but within African context, cultures within a country, within the continent, are fighting each other, rival. Some cultures are believing that they are superior and the others are inferior. And now yeah. ethnic-based and religious-based uh, factions are everywhere. People don't yeah. don't talk to each other, don't listen to each other. They don't want to so solve a problem. They are fighting on uh, an issue that happened 100 years ago. Yeah. But still, they have a problem in, the, in their day-to-day -day life. They don't want to change their future and their present. They are fighting on a dead uh, dog. So I don't know why they choose that way, but uh, the European uh, issue or the European experience telling us Europeans did a mistake once where in their ambition to, to become dominant uh, in the world and to become you know, more powerful than others, but they get their lesson and now they are discussing and they, they want to resolve the historical issues. That's what we are seeing in, in, in Canada. The Canadian government and the Canadian society is trying to negotiate and trying to resolve historical problems with the native people and with the, uh, you know, with the black people. And with, I don't know how, 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 uh, how far uh, they are committed to, to change it, but they are doing it. We are watching in news. In, we, we read there seems to be some learning, yeah. uh, whether it will be permanent or not, yeah. that we can't keep doing it the way we used to do it, where factions fight each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, the history of Europe. I traveled in Italy a number of years ago, and it was just fascinating in central Italy. Every hilltop had a fortified town on it. Oh. Huge fortifications. And what that meant was that 
that town didn't get along with the one on the next hill. And they were fighting each other all the time. They couldn't trust each other. Yeah. Little little duchies, little little not, they weren't even a united country, uh, Italy, until relatively recently in European history. Yeah. Um, it, it's not fair to pick on Italy because it happened in all the countries in Europe that uh, it, there was conflict between centers of power or, or centers of uh, residence yeah. and whether they were uh, ethnically different or just uh, economically competitive mm. doesn't really matter. And this is what we've learned. We can't keep doing this where, you know, the French and the German fight and the Protestants and the Catholics fight and uh, uh, the Browns and the whites fight. It, it, we can't keep doing it. There seems to have been some learning that were, while we may be inclined that way, while there may be injustices that we want to see addressed, while the other side may not be listening and be prepared to come to the table, nonetheless, we can't keep doing it that way. And we have to find a collaborative, progressive way to do better. I think in a consensual way amongst uh, free people, this is not something that has happened a lot in human history on a massive scale. Mm. There have been some societies where there have been uh, egalitarian rights for most citizens, uh, but not many. And I've never seen, uh, I'm not aware of any societies where, I mean, look, at, we're talking billions of people now yeah. uh, who are trying to to figure out how to get along. I'm, uh, that's never happened before. Mm. And uh, it's a hell of a challenge. Uh, so of course our habits, our beliefs, our resentments from the past are going to remain present. And we have to help each other to figure out when to compromise, when to forgive, when to resist. Uh, and we have to recognize it'll take a long time to build our new world. Uh, I think, uh before we wrap up, uh, do you have any anything to add about the the issues that we are discussing so far about the Black uh, History Month or about the future of the Black and White, you know, uh, relationship in, in in this world, not only in America and Canada, even in the, in the world. So, what do you expect of the future, you know, about this issue? Uh, I think humanity is slowly, slowly learning mm. that uh, we can't keep doing it the way we used to, mm. that we are the enemy. We are the ones who need to work on things, not the other guy, it's us. We need to work on it. And we might suffer. We might suffer from that attitude. Humans have suffered before for what they believe in and for standing up on principles. We might suffer. But nonetheless, we have no choice because doing what we did before has led to wars that now threaten all of our existences. Uh, what we've been doing before in terms of um, raping our environment so that we can live comfortably or richly now is destroying the planet. We can't carry on. We are slowly learning that we can do it better and do it differently. And I actually have some hope, some optimism about those things. And when it comes to black and white, or we talk black and white, but it's people from different backgrounds and different uh, ethnicities, different religions, different countries uh, getting along, there are more and more and more examples of that happening. And I, I'm, I'm happy that some of them are in Canada. I'm happy I've met people who have enriched my life and I'm hopeful that uh, we can continue, we will continue to, to grow and learn and uh, make this world a better place. Yes. With that, we came to the end of our program. Visit our website at thisperspective.com. Goodbye.